Last week wasn't such a good idea. He doesn't look like he's going to pass some of this week. Yes, <laughs> that's true. Yeah, that's I did come close. So. Uh oh. That wasn't good. That was not a lot. Well, good morning. Good, good morning. morning. Good morning. I can actually come up here and slow down. <laughs> it's been a busy morning because I forgot a slide, so I had to fix that. That, for those of you that are watching online, welcome. We are trying something different this week. For the last two weeks, the uh, business suite app that we normally use to stream the live has been crashing and literally just turning itself off. So we are live on Facebook. It looks different for those of you online because it is up and down instead of across. But if I stand over here, you're not gonna see me, so I'm gonna have to stay right here. But we got it going. <clears throat> Diane's gonna give me a look if we lose it, I'm sure. <laughs> if we do, we'll fix it, we'll get it up. It's a minor inconvenience, just like I thought was talking about last week. So, that all said, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Isn't it nice out? Yeah. Um, the grass is green, which is really weird for February. Yeah. Don was saying on the way here, he's like, the trees are gonna get confused and the leaves are gonna come out if it keeps this up, which, that could happen, but I'm sure winter is just laying in wait for us. So it'll be back. We'll enjoy what we have for right now. Uh, this Wednesday night, and we're going to have Bible study at seven o'clock. But I'm going to throw Diane off here, and I'm going to have her switch a slide to one that says seven words on it, just to confuse her. It's not in order. This is the one that I tried to add and got in the wrong place. This one? Nope. It should be one that says seven words on it. Is it not in there? Oh. Oh, that's, fair. that's all right. No worries. It is this. So, uh, starting. There we go. So, we have a Lenten series. I was counting seven words. Oh. I was like, that's more than seven She words. took me literally. <laughs> My bad. You'd think after 25 years, I'd have that figured out. I'll take the blame on that one. So Seven Words is the series that uh, Mark and I prayed about and have chosen for our Lenten series this year. That It's going to be a little bit, you know, we're starting off just a little bit differently because we have to fit Ash Wednesday in there. And so uh, a little bit out of order, but we want to make sure that it's all done before Holy Week. So next Sunday, our series starts with um, Father, Forgive Them. And the rest of the series is today you will be with me in paradise. My God, my God, woman, here is your son. I am thirsty and ending in with into your hands the week before Holy Week, the week before we start Palm Sunday. And then the study is going to start this week. Because the 14th, which would traditionally been when we would have started, is Ash Wednesday. So Diane's going to switch screens again, and there we go, Ash Wednesday service on February 14th. So join us for that as we uh, have a, it's a very solemn service. We will have the imposition of the ashes, and uh, we invite you to join us for that service at 7 o'clock on the 14th. Now, just to mess her up a little bit more, next Saturday will be changing everything around. It's been three months since we've done that. Seems like forever and it seems like yesterday, but we'll be changing everything around and kicking off season 19 of Orange Track Racing. Uh, registration at 9.30 with racing at 10. If you know somebody who might be interested, there are flyers and business cards back there that you can take and share with those folks. Then we're gonna fast forward to March. March 2nd, we will be skipping our men's breakfast, which in this case is a good thing. It's not like we're not having it. We're just going to go somewhere instead. We're going to go to Davenport and spend the day with probably 11, 1,200 other guys worshiping and really sharpening one another. Uh, conferences from 8.30 to 4. As you can see, Don Davis and Chris Harper are our keynote speakers, and then there will be uh, breakout sessions that go along with that. Sign up sheet is in the back. If you haven't signed up, please do so we can get those tickets ordered here in the very near future. Then we don't have a date for the next one, 
but we're going to be showing Finding Normal in March. So it won't be the first Saturday because there's no way we can get back, get everything set up and have a movie night. It may be the racing Saturday, it may be the next one. We don't know yet, we'll announce that here in the, in the next week or so to let you know uh, what that looks like. At the end of the service, we will be showing the trailer for it and I suddenly realized that when I was re-watching it uh, yet again today that, oh wait, I think I've seen this. It's a good movie. So we invite you to join us. What's it about? So uh, Finding Normal is about Dr. Lisa Leland, who is on her way across country to launch a new practice with her, I like how they put this, equally brilliant boyfriend doctor. That is until she has an unexpected encounter in normal North Carolina that derails her plans when she has a run-in with a small town cop. Kind of reminded me of Barney Pipe a little bit, but... <laughs> and she is subsequently sentenced to community service. Now she's stuck in the middle of nowhere with no cell reception. Oh. This is an older movie, like early 2000s, so it was possible back then to have no reception. But she also doesn't have any Wi-Fi access, she doesn't have any credit card access because uh, where she's at. And so she will be doing her community service, filling in for the ailing small town's doctor. And she begins to discover that a normal life may just be what she is looking for. So that's the quick synopsis. Again, we'll watch the trailer at the end. We'll make sure that it gets added to the playlist for those of you that are watching online. And then, well, I can't forget this. We're going to announce it now, and then we might not announce it for another week or two. But we want to get it out there. March 10th, you'll lose an hour. We have to spring forward. So before you go to bed on the 9th, Set your clocks forward, unless all you use is your phone, then it does it for you, and you're all good. Now, for those of you that are watching online, we did sh I shortened the URL. I used a tiny URL to shorten it because it's usually so long, it takes up a lot of room. So I shortened it. That is the uh, link that goes out to the worship music. So please feel free to watch that once the live has ended. Correct, hopefully not before it should. And with all that said, before we get to our call to worship, yesterday I found something in my personal memory, something that I had posted up on Facebook, and I shared it first to our Grace Street page because I felt like that's where it needed to start this year. And it says this, the church should be seen as a hospital, a rehab clinic, a place of refuge. The church is not a country club. Stop, stop treating it like one. The person smoking outside the church doors, the woman in inappropriate clothing, the man with whiskey on his breath, these are children of God, not excuses to pass judgmental glances at. Ask them their story. Buy them coffee. And this is why I, I chose this. Really listen to them. That is the gospel. Not telling them that they need to get their act together in order to attend church. It's attending church by the power of the Holy Spirit that they will get their act together. Our call to worship this morning comes from John chapter 27. And I was telling some of the folks that were here early that I struggled with a, a background for this service today. And I started with one and I went to another and then I thought, oh, when I want to listen to God, which is our our title of our sermon today, I like to go out into the nature. I like to walk through the forest. So I had a forest picture, and then I realized that with the path through it, then I realized that with all the trees, it was pretty busy. Mm -hmm. You couldn't see very well through it. And then God said, what about your call to worship? Mm -hmm. You're talking about sheep in the sheepfold. Mm -hmm. And this morning at 6, 6.30, whatever it was, here we have an ancient sheepfold. The John 10, 27, the New Living Translation says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Now, some of you may have the ability to hear a song and know the artist. That's not me. I'm not good at that. You may even be able to sing a lot of the words, and I'm not so good at that either. The same goes for movie buffs. 
If you hear a voice, you know who the actor is. You might even be able to rattle off some of their most famous work lines. When a baby hears its mother or father's voice, they know it. In the same way, when we hear God speak to us, we should know it. I'm going to cut back from verse 27 all the way to the beginning of that chapter, verses 1 through 5, where Jesus says this, I tell you the truth, anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. The imagery that Jesus is using here is to describe himself. And it's one that would have been easily understood in that time. We're not as agrarian as they were then, where just about everyone had livestock or a, you know, a farm of some kind. But what it does, it also emphasizes the importance of Jesus' followers, his sheep, us, having a personal knowledge of and relationship with him, our shepherd. I, for one, will not follow someone that I do not know. That goes for any manner of things, whether it's at work, at, well, for those of you in school, at school, whether it could be politics, it could be an organization, even here at church. Mark and I would never expect someone to follow us blindly without getting to know us. That's why it is so important for us to be listening to God. Now, for some of you, this is going to go way back. For me, it goes way, way back. So, can you still hear your mom or dad's voice saying this? Are you listening to me? Usually a lot louder and with a little more attitude, but you get the idea. For those of us that are married, you may have heard your husband or wife ask the same question. Are you listening to me? If you're like me, I'll say yes, and then I'll rattle it off word for word. Very irritating, because you know what? I wasn't hearing, I wasn't listening to what was being said. I could say the words. It's just like anyone who has a Bible and has memorized all these verses, yet they have no idea what they mean. You may have even said to your parents or to your spouse or to whomever, I heard you. Mm -hmm. Sure you did. I like to be doing something, and I'll be working on something, and all of a sudden, I hear a voice talking to me, and I'm expected to just drop whatever it is and listen. <laughs> but in this case, if it's your parents, if it's your spouse, you should drop it and listen. Even if it's your boss, drop it and listen. Oftentimes, you might be in the middle of that conversation where you have been listening, and all of a sudden, they say something and it sparks something else, and all of a sudden, your mind goes off this way or that way, and then you just start hearing but not listening. Many people use the words hearing and listening interchangeably. And this is a quote from uh, Kelly Workman. She's a psychologist at Columbia University Medical Center. 
She said many people use the words hearing and listening interchangeably. However, there are several important differences between the two. You see, according to her, hearing is the passive intake of sound. So, having music playing in the background. Yesterday during men's breakfast, as we were uh, eating and, and talking and, and going through the devotion, in the background, very slow was music playing. I honestly didn't hear it the whole time we were talking because I was focused on the conversation we were having. But that's what we, that's what hearing is. It's passively listening to something. According to her, hearing is that passive intake of sound while listening is the act of intentionally working to comprehend the sounds that you hear. And many of you might be thinking of the old phrase, in one ear and out the other, that's hearing, not listening. Hearing is involuntary and it requires no effort at all, where listening is voluntary and requires much effort. I was reading, any day, you can, I can be sitting there in the morning and reading my scriptures and I'm listening to the words and then I hear, I hear a word, I hear a phrase, I hear something and off goes my mind. And it's like recenter, come back and reread because I didn't listen well. If we're listening, we're choosing to understand what is being said and we take the time to do it. But other things get in the way. We quit having our men's breakfast after the first one in a restaurant because we couldn't hear each other talk. It was so loud. Other times you might be out. We went on a date night to a restaurant that had just opened. I couldn't hear a word name was there. The acoustics were so if you wanted to listen to music, it would have been awesome, but for having a meal and a conversation, it wasn't. It might be kids running around screaming and hollering trying to get your attention, or at least to see how many of your buttons they can press. You may be on a phone call and having issues hearing the other person, cutting in and out. Ask just about any Christian and they will tell you that God is the most important person in their lives. But I have to wonder, how many of them are actually listening and only hearing? What is it that gets in the way of listening to God? If we go back to that passage from our call to worship in John 10.3, Jesus says, And the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. To give it a little more context, at night the sheep were often gathered into a sheepfold to protect them from the thieves, the weather, or wild animals. The shepherd would sleep at the entrance to protect them, so the shepherd would be right there at the opening. Jesus, who is called the Good Shepherd, cares for us. We are his sheep. At that time, a shepherd would not drive sheep. You know, we hear about cattle drives, right? From the Old West, they drove the cattle. But they did not. They led them. Whether the shepherd used a flute or a song or some kind of music or even verbal commands, the sheep knew the shepherd. And because they were led and not driven, the trust was built. And they would follow the shepherd. People who truly belong to God listen to and believe in Jesus' words. Throughout Scripture, we see the word hear or listen. In the Old Testament, the word for, uh, the word for hear is shema. So translated to English, it means hear or listen. And it is often used to emphasize the act of listening, understanding, and obeying. And we'll tell you this all the time. The words in the Hebrew or the Aramaic, the ancient languages that the scriptures were written in have very different meanings. What we use the word for love, there are seven actual words in the ancient language that were used for that. 
You know, a little bit ago I mentioned that uh, things that would interfere with our ability to truly listen. One of the issues in our culture today is that we are often expected to multitask. Doing multiple things at the same time. Now, I don't know about you all, but I can't multitask to save my life. I can do one thing at a time very quickly, but I can't multitask. And if I try, I miss things. If I'm on a call with a customer and they're talking to me and I try to do something, answer a question somebody throws up in Microsoft Teams or in an email, I'm going to miss potentially something very important from what they had to tell me. Basically, it divides our focus. That is why we have to be intentional about listening and paying attention. Again, we may hear, but we'll fully fail in understanding what is being said. So let's put this into a biblical context. Hearing does not simply include hearing words. It includes actively listening and making an effort to understand. If we're going to listen to God, we need to be in the proper frame of mind. If we are not, we will not understand the lessons that are being taught. Through the Gospels, Jesus uses parables to teach, which in turn caused the people to think. Because of this, these parables would conceal the truth from those who were too stubborn or prejudiced or hard-hearted to actually hear the message. That's why in Ezekiel we hear the words, Take, to go from a stone, a heart of stone to a heart of flesh. That's the prayer that was prayed over, and his mind escapes me, in the case of Christ. Lee Strobel. There we go. I just had to talk my way through it. That's what his wife prayed for him. She prayed those words out of Ezekiel for him because he was such a staunch atheist. So let's listen to one of those parables. This comes from Mark chapter 4, verses 3 through 9. Listen, a farmer went out to plant some seed. As he scattered it across his field, some of the seed fell on a footpath, and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seed sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow, but the plant soon withered under the hot sun. And since it didn't have deep roots, it died. Other seed fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants so that they produced no grain. So other seeds fell on fertile soil and they sprouted, grew and produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as had been planted. And then he said, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. I don't know what led me to this passage and I had never read it with this lens but in this parable we see what it looks like when different kinds of hearts encounter the word of God that part I get but it's the part of how this all goes into listening and understanding God's word unlike today the farm or the ground then was not plowed first and we, we see that every spring the farmers are out in the fields, they're plowing it up, preparing the field to receive the grain. That didn't happen then. They didn't have the implements that we had today. You had a hoe <laughs> or some implement to create a row to plant the seed in. And even if you had, pardon the word that comes to mind, it's jury rigged, uh, some kind of a plow, there was no weight to it because it would have been made out of maybe some iron, but mostly wood, and it would have been pulled by the ox. And it would have been very difficult. Somebody would have had to have been standing on it, probably pushing it down to keep it in. So they had to generously put the seed out. Kind of like the way that I salt my food, or I mean the way that the uh, powdered sugar is on the donuts over on the treat table. The seed is God's word. And by planting it generously, 
the farmer could get a harvest. God's word planted generously gets into the hearts of the people. And in this passage, thinking of the hearts of the people as the different types of the ground. In effect, we're hearing Jesus' words, and we need to believe them. It also means using them in all aspects of our lives, from our attitudes, our decisions, to our relationships. And you know, you get the idea. I could go on all day, and I'd probably be getting this from Diane at some point. But we have to let God's word permeate every part of our lives. In hearing and understanding Jesus' words, we are making him Lord. Jesus invites us to listen and obey, encouraging us to pay careful attention to his words. Now, in between that first passage and the passage I'm about to read, the disciples are like confused and they don't understand. So in starting in verse 13, Jesus said to them, if you can't understand the meaning of this parable, how will you understand all the other parables? The farmer plants seed by taking God's word to others. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message only to have Satan come at once and take it away. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or as persecuted for believing God's word. The seed that fell among the thorns represent others who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life, the lure of wealth and the desire for other things, so no fruit is produced. And the seed that fell in the good soil represents those who hear and accept God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as has been planted. You've heard it said here before, believe and receive. Uh, those with a hard heart refuse to listen, so therefore they refuse to believe and refuse to receive. Those, there are those who hear God's word, but the noise of the world is so loud. They too fail to really listen. If we're not listening and making God the priority in our lives, then we will not grow spiritually. We cannot exclude God's kingdom in anything. Jesus isn't just asking us to audibly hear his words and carry on with our personal agenda, kind of what we talked about yesterday in the men's group, how athletes give all the glory to themselves. Not all of them, but some give glory to themselves for what they do. People do this in their personal lives, at work, at home. Look what I did. There's more than one king or one person in the Bible who was punished by God for that. God is urging us to actively listen and obey and to live by his truth. Listening and obeying are what build our faith in Christ. Hearing the word of God should lead to a transformed life marked by fruitfulness. So not just hearing and putting it in, in going out and living that way, but being fruitful with it. Because when we're truly listening, we are welcoming God's word into our lives. We will believe it. We will obey it. And we will produce abundant fruit because of its impact. Not just on our own lives, but on the lives of those around us. So how do we distinguish whose voice we hear? Because that can be a difficult one. Is it our own? Is it the world? Is it Satan? Or is what you are hearing God's voice? very dangerous not knowing whose voice it is. For the sheep, it meant either being stolen or killed. Well, in the grand scheme of things, for us, it means either being stolen or killed, if we're not listening. Imagine a soldier in combat talking to someone on the radio and not being able to tell that person is their commander or the enemy. They can't tell the difference in whose voice they hear their lives and the lives of those around them are in danger. 
And that goes for us. If we don't know the voice we're hearing, it's dangerous. God's voice and Satan's voice are very different. God is sincere. Satan, uh, he's very deceptive. Let's take a moment and look at some of the differences. The Bible will always verify what God tells us. However, Satan will try to undermine what the Bible says by questioning it, as he did with Jesus in the wilderness. You want to see a perfect example of him trying to deceive? Read that passage. God's voice will bring glory to him. Satan's voice brings you the glory. God's voice will lead you to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. Satan will encourage you to affirm yourself, to avoid a cross, and to follow your own desires. That's why so many self-help books are very dangerous. God will guide you to build up the church. Satan will sow seeds of discord among God's people. So go back to the story last week of the conference for the demons and how you can confuse everyone. God's voice will be absolutely true, but Satan will taint his message with untruths. Look at what he did to Adam and Eve. Listen to how Jesus calls out those who are being led by Satan, and he pulls no punches here. Then Jesus told them, if God were your father, you would love me because I have come to you from God. I'm not here on my own, but he sent me. Why can't you understand what I am saying? It's because you can't even hear me. For you are the children of your father, the devil. And you love to do evil things. He does. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So when I tell the truth, you just naturally don't believe me. Which of you can truthfully accuse me of sin? And since I'm telling you the truth, why don't you believe me? Anyone who belongs to God listens gladly to the words of God, but you don't listen because you don't belong to God. Ever been a party to that? Someone says something about you, a, a lie, and no matter how hard you try to dispel it, and even bringing facts, you can bring all the facts you want, you can bring a buck of facts, and people won't believe. They just believe the bad thing. Well, these religious leaders were not able to understand because they refused to listen. Satan was able to use that stubbornness and pride and prejudice we talked about, and no, not the book to keep them from believing in Jesus. Satan is the master of those half-truths. God's voice fosters humility. Satan's voice produces pride. Finally, God's voice exposes sin, bringing a sense of conviction. Satan attempts you, or attempts you to justify that sin and to make excuses for your behavior. Think of a multitude of things that that falls into. The non-believing world, they are going to embrace that sin and those selfish behaviors. And we as Christians live by a different standard, but we have to be careful not to let the secular values overtake our God-given values. When the world gets really loud, that can happen. People take and cherry-pick scripture and they twist it and turn it and make it what they want it to be instead of what God had int intended it to be. So without listening to the voice of our shepherd, we run the risk of God's word being watered down. Proverbs 3, we are warned against following our own voices. Verses 5 and 6 say, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. In the Hebrew, the word for trust means to lie down on, to put your entire weight on something. Like going to bed at night, you put your entire weight on the mattress. With all your heart means 
entirely, with no exceptions. In essence, God says, trust me completely. I alone can sustain you. Your own understanding will not support you and will fail you. Seeking God's will will cover everything in your life, and it will guide you on the right path. You'll be amazed at all the obstacles that God can and will remove as you do. The key to being able to recognize and listen to God's voice is relationship. We have to have this relationship before we can have these relationships. My relationship with Diane over the past 25 years has gotten stronger. And trust me, I know her voice. But it wasn't always that way. When we first met, I didn't know hardly anything about her. Nor she, me. We still don't know everything about each other. But it's a lifelong process. It's a process that is solidified by our commitment to one another. And just like everyone else, we've had our fair share of bumps and bruises along the way. But it's the same in our relationship with God. It's a lifelong process solidified by our commitment to Him. Now there's one major difference in that relationship. With one another, well, that relationship, one person may forget, may slide. With God, He never forgets. His side of that relationship will never, ever change, no matter what we say or do. It only changes on our end. So, can we say the same about our relationship with him, that it will not slide? That we will do everything we can to keep it the same? Well, here's some things that we can do starting today. First, spend time in the Word. Don't just read it, meditate on it. Prayerfully think about the words you are reading. In other words, listen to God. Second, pray. Remember what we talked about last week? It's okay to be real and wrong. It's okay to tell him all of the things that are going on. He wants to, when, think about when you're, if you have kids, you want to hear what's going on in their lives. Start your day in prayer. End your day in prayer. But don't just bookend it in prayer. Pray throughout the day. Maybe a short prayer, maybe a long prayer. It may be very general, but don't be afraid to be bold and specific and persistent in your prayer. Third, learn to see God in your life. Now, you may be going through one of the worst imaginable things in your life. Look for God in it. Look for how God had been preparing you for it. What he did to prepare you for whatever you're going through at that moment may have been more powerful than anything you take out of it, but it may make it more powerful what you do take out of it because you see it from God's perspective. When you do that, it'll make a difference in how you perceive what's happening. Fourth, look for how God is guiding other believers. Now, here's the thing, and this is why we talk about going to our end, sharpens iron as men. You can't do that. So in other words, you can't look at how other people are being guided by God if you are isolating yourself from other Christians. You may not be isolating yourself from other people, but you need to stay in fellowship and be with other Christians. And not just talking about the weather or what's going on in life, but truly studying God's word and hearing what he has for you. Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. So as we come together each time, we sharpen one another. As we come together for Bible study, as we talk and answer questions, 
we sharpen one another. Men's group yesterday, we sharpened one another. When we surround ourselves with other believers, they will challenge us. You gotta remember not to get upset by that, because that's a good thing. Because they are just trying to help us make good decisions. They will help us to grow in our relationship with the Lord. When iron sharpens iron, it is no longer dull. Have you ever tried to cut a loaf of bread with a dull knife? It doesn't go very well. When a believer sharpens another believer, it makes each of them better. God has been, is, and will continue to speak to each and every one of us. He just wants each of us to listen. Lord, forgive us for letting the noise of this world drown out your voice. We long to hear your voice to guide and direct us. Remind us to spend time with you in your word. And as we do, let your words teach us. It is my prayer that the Holy Spirit would bring those words to life. Through our daily prayers, we seek to draw closer to you, Lord. Quiet our souls so that we can sense your loving presence and listen as you speak. Father, it is so easy with all the busyness of our lives to stay connected to you. Use our time with you in the word and through prayer to align our hearts with yours. You are always there with us. Help us to always be there with you, listening to what you have to say. Help us to tune out everything else so that we can hear your voice above it all. Thank you for the peace that comes when we take the time to really listen. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <coughs>
healing for you as well. Yes, and for me too. And that you get that surgery. Yes, hopefully I will get the surgery soon. We're, we're praying for that. Oh. So let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we come to you today with open minds and hearts to hear the words you have ordained for us. Let us praise and thank you for all you have done. In Psalms 9, 1 and 2, it states, I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonders. I will be glad and re rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Thank you, God, for your faithfulness and your amazing love. We come to you this morning and we lift up Mark to you, Father. Please walk with him through this trial he is in. Heal his leg completely and quickly ease his pain as only you can. Comfort him and Lori as they walk through the trial together. Also, Father, we lift up Joe and Deb as they heal, and we ask for your provision for them as well. We lift up Don to you, Father, and we ask for your healing for the dizziness, for it to go away. You gave him a sound mind, Father God, and we know that you will heal him in your time. And we ask uh, prayers for Becky's mom. She's in the hospital. Her liver is rejecting fluids, Father God. We ask you to come into that hospital room. We ask the Holy Spirit to reside in her and to heal her body, Lord Jesus. Just comfort them as they go through this trial, Lord Jesus. Father, thank you for the beautiful weather we are having. We are so grateful that you are comforting the homeless through our winter months to give them warmth and shelter to sustain them during this time. And Father, we ask to lift up, lift up Amanda to you. She had another surgery this week, and we praise you that it went well, and you are guiding her through this. Walk with her, Father God, and help her to know she is so loved by you. Father, I lift up my granddaughter, Vienna, and her husband, Taylor. Taylor's dad passed away this week unexpectedly. Life is precious, Father God, and we have no idea when we will be called home. But we, have, but we know we have a God in heaven that, it, that knows all things, is above all things, and is in the detail of all things. I ask that you comfort them, Jesus, with the peace that passes all understanding, because they know you and you know them, and your love is without borders. Your love is divine, and it heals the broken hearts of men. Thank you, Jesus, for this blessing. And Father, we thank you for Psalms 5, 11 through 12. Let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may rejoice in you. For surely, O Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with your favor as with a shield. And may all who seek you, Lord, be blessed. In Jesus' holy name, amen. amen. Praise God, the live stream is still on. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Denise. As we close out this portion of our service and prepare to worship through music, join me as we pray. Father, we thank you that you desire to speak to us each and every day. Thank you for guiding us in spirit and in truth so that we can obey your word and enjoy an abundant life. We thank you that you have called us as your children and that we can come boldly before you because of your immense grace. Lord, your word says that when we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. So we draw near to you today, Father. We seek your face, your truth, and your word for our lives. We want to know you more. We want to hear your voice and obey you more. Scripture tells us that your sheep know your voice and that we will not follow the voice of a stranger. Help us to know your voice and not be deceived by any others. Guard our hearts from the influence of this world. Do not let us be deceived by Satan and his lies. I pray that we would view all our thoughts and make all our decisions through the leading of the Holy Spirit. Give us the wisdom and discernment to know your voice above all the others, Lord. In Jesus' name.